I am editing this video and realized that I really screwed up my Zoom call with Boo Walker. <sighs> I know. When I'm talking, you'll see me. When he's talking, you'll see him. It's not split screen the way I wanted it to, but I need to learn how to use Zoom better. That's about it. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle and I am here with Boo Walker and we are talking about his brand new book, just came out, it's called An Unfinished Story, came out August 4th, I love the cover. First of all, I love my Lake Union authors. I am a huge Lake Union reader. They are good. I'm, I'm constantly impressed. Constantly. I mean, I, I the, the list goes on of all my Lake Union authors that I have supported over the years. That's what made me first pick up your book because I was like, oh, I haven't read any of his books. He's a Lake Union author. He's got to be good. And then I read this book and I was blown away. So I go on Amazon because I never read reviews. It, it doesn't interest me before I read a book. But afterwards, just to put a little bit of perspective, I am not the only one who who thinks this, okay? <laughs> you have 152 five-star reviews and your Goodreads rating is the highest I have seen in a long time, a 4.53. Unbelievable. I mean, seriously, this book did not just touch me, but it touched a lot of people. And this story, I was like, is it because I, I'm 55? And I'm like, am I just getting old and sentimental or something? <laughs> <laughs> Because I just kept tearing up and tearing up. So I, I'm going to set up the story and then I'm going to let you talk about it a little bit. Okay. Perfect. So okay. We have Claire and we have Whitaker. You did it from two points of view and Claire, we find out in the very beginning, this, we don't do spoilers, boo. I tell, I always tell everybody no spoilers. Deal. Okay. Deal. okay. There, could, there could be a few here. There could be, and I don't want to do that. But um, we find out early on in the first chapter she, that she becomes a widow. By the end of the first chapter, which is what I'm always, the, as a reader, they ha you have to get me to chapter two. I have so many books. I'm a book reviewer. If you cannot get me to that second chapter, I'm out because I have so many. And right that the end, I even went back and read it again today. And I was like, how did he get me there? And it's like, because Claire is at the beginning of chapter one, we're finding out that David says, this is our forever home. And look at, I could get teary eyed. Talking about <laughs> and by the end of the first chapter where she's cleaning it out to sell it. And she does, she's never gone in his office. So she doesn't know what she's going to find. And I'm like, what is she going to find? I, I had to read chapter two. I had to find out what she was going to find. This story touched so many people. How did you do it? How did you come up with this story? Well, it, so I left, I've been writing a series in wine country in Washington state that was coming to a conclusion. And um, my wife and I decided it was time for a move and we're typically, we're gypsies. So we, we move often. It's crazy how much we move. And we decided to move to Florida, which is where my wife's from. And we were craving a bit of, we'd had a really bad winter and um, we were craving some nicer weather. And we kept hearing about St. Pete and we moved to St. Pete and into this really cool neighborhood, into this old Spanish villa house that was built in the twenties back when, um, uh, Marilyn Monroe and Mickey Mantle and Babe Ruth and tons of people were in St. Pete and instantly I was just mesmerized by the city. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we started to settle in. I had just done it. Well, I guess it, the, the story started in my head because I started going to the front door of our house and I kept imagining for some really weird reason, this widow standing at the door holding this manuscript. And I swear it, it was like a recurring thing, like a daydream. Like, you know, I would literally go to the door and open it. And I kept thinking that would be really wild. And I wonder if I would write it because I was in the midst of coming up with stories for Lake Union. And when you have the pressure of coming up with three stories for a new book proposal, there's a lot of pressure and it's what you're always thinking about. I kept thinking, I wonder if I would take that story and try to run with it if I could and come up with another one. And then I started to think, well, what if she was a younger widow? And then what if she was beautiful? And then I started thinking, well, then who am I? And I, I, I said, well, this is the perfect opportunity for me to write like a wacky, wacky autobiography of sorts. Like if I want to, I, I, I'm, I was 40 at the time when I started writing it and going through a classic midlife crisis of which many I've gone through. 
<laughs> and um, it was so easy to tap into this idea of what if my name was Whitaker Grant? I just ruined my uh, marriage because I can't write a second book, but I'm a famous author because of this book I wrote 10 years earlier. And I try all the time and I make up excuses. I'm, my life is, is just falling apart. I'm wearing a bathrobe. I'm eating cold leftovers. I barely sleep in the bed. And I'm just desperate for a story. And my whole ego is wrapped around a story. And if I can't write a second one, then I'm a one-hit wonder. I'm a has-been. I just need a break. But I'm so closed down that even when a woman knocks on the door and gives me a story, I'm not receptive to it. I don't see that, hey, I mean, if I let my ego go, there's a story here and this could be my next book. And not only that, but you could help someone who really needs you because this woman, Claire, that I started to imagine, she's looking for a way, a, a way through losing her husband three years earlier. And when she finds this manuscript, she thinks, well, it's almost done and it's really good. What if I can get Whitaker Grant, who is this famous writer, to write it and to finish it and then we can publish it? Then not only could I honor my deceased husband, but maybe I could get past the grieving stage as a last gift. And, you know, maybe that's right and maybe not. But of course, the next thing that uh, I started thinking about was, and, and this is the last part that we can go before we give too much away, is right. what happens if those two have a connection? Yeah. And you know, I kept thinking early on in the book, this is me thinking, I'm like, well, why don't you just write it? Why don't you do, why do you keep looking for him? Why don't you just sit down and write the book, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, sure. You know, I kept thinking because as a woman, you know, like, and somebody who reads a lot, but I was like, Obviously, she she did not think she could do that. Okay, that was my thinking. I'm like, the the more he rejected her, the more the woman in me was like, just do it yourself. You know, stop asking him. Just sit down. But she's got a little restaurant. You know, she's a little busy. She's, she's yeah, <laughs> and maybe I guess she's thinking she's pretty down on herself. You know, I really studied a lot of about grief and losing someone, and she she's not coming from a very healthy, confident place. Exactly. So I, I was thinking that as far as she wants to find someone that's worthy of writing and giving the last homage to her husband because she doesn't feel that she has it herself, you know. Yeah. And Whitaker Grant used to write in her restaurant. And, right. and like you said, she does. She has a really successful restaurant and she's no slouch either. No, no. That's what I mean. Like to me, she was so successful. The reason you love her so much is because she does, she has this outward success, but then she's got this inner turmoil. I watched my mom be a widow at 40. And so I think I connected a lot with her watch, you know, watching my mom go through it. At that time, I was thinking, well, she's 40. She's so old. Of course, I'm 55 now. So 40 is not old at all. 40 is actually really young to be a widow. So, uh, you know, <laughs> so it's, you know, it's a little bit of perspective. Another thing is I read like three books at a time, which is to me, always the one that I go back to the most and I put the other like I didn't even care about those other books I read your book I just I was like no I stayed up night I read it right through and that to me is like such a testament to what kind of a book it is when I am putting the others aside and just focusing on your book and that's Thank what I was like so I have to tell him I have to tell him that I never read his other books you've written so many books because I went back and looked and I'm like wow this is the first one that I've read of yours and I connect with it and I I loved it I'm like I, where is he I gotta tell him I just have to tell him how much I love this book and oh well your email made my day I <laughs> did it <laughs> and what a connection I found with Claire even though I'm not a widow it doesn't matter the woman in her and who she's trying to be is what I really connected I've gone through divorce so take any kind of grief you want you're gonna connect with her and him, like, you know, we, <laughs> him, you just want to like slap a couple times and say, you know, like, wake oh, up. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> but then you he was, he really, he was fun to write. I mean, I, it was instantly like when I got to a Whitaker chapter, it's like, okay, just tap into the most insane part of myself and right. um, just have fun. Whereas Claire really took a lot of work. And it's no surprise that as a male author writing a female point of view, it's not easy. And I've been doing it for some reason. I keep 
doing it. And I don't know whether it's my love of a challenge or, or whatever it is. This is probably my fourth book with female point of views, but they always take work. And that's, that is, I give Lake Union a lot of credit because I have such an awesome editing team and they really got behind me and helped me, um, including my agent. My agent's the first one who said, okay, let's back up with Claire, who used to be Ruby in the beginning. The, the whole editing team just said, we're not quite there with Claire. We get Whitaker, of course, he's adorable. You get him. But Claire, we have to work on. And I went back and back and back. At some point, she wasn't even in the book. And then she came in six chapters later. And then eventually it was like, she needs to be at the beginning of the book. This is her story. So then we changed her name to Claire. And I started connecting her to my grandmother, who had a big love of the beach. And I started to really see her. And and all of a sudden, she had these wild big glasses. And she had this restaurant. And she really came alive. But I, I credit the Lake Union team for pushing me there because I I, if, if, if I've got all five stars, like Union had a lot to do with it. Well, you know, what I found interesting too is that they put it in the category of women's fiction. Well, I always love Amazon's like subcategories anyway, but I was thinking, wow, you did really get me into Claire. Like I don't read many books that a man will write from a woman's point of view that can hook me the way you did with Claire. So I was like, that's another question I have to ask. As a woman, I'm like, how do you do that? How did he know what to hit on with her emotions. It wasn't just, you know, when she was sad, but also when she got real determined is when I loved her. Yeah. I loved well, her you, determination. You know what I've learned over the course of these, I guess it is probably for, this is my fifth book with female point of views. And I have a strong female team around me. I have my wife and my agent who are both um, really strong females and will slap my hand the moment I write something that creates a weak female, you know? And I've started to learn that, um, I, I've just started to find the power in, what a woman feels like inside. And I also have this incredible beta reading team that's 90% women. And they all are kind of the same way. They'll all slap my hand and say, no, 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 this is not right. This is not right. So I think I'd like to think I'm learning. I'm, I'm still a million miles away, but I think maybe it's fun too. I, I can't think of a lot of authors that do it other than Sidney Sheldon comes to mind. And I used to read tons of his books and I, I, and he, um, I think he had a lot of sisters and he said, yeah. that's why he did that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the, they're predominantly female point of views. And then Nicholas Sparks, of course, bounces back and forth pretty easily. And I think it's pretty masterful. And I guess the thing that I try to do is, of course, I don't try to be a woman, but I just I try to find the similarities that we all have. Right. You know, because I think we do. We all have big yeah. dreams and we all have wants of love and belonging and, and stuff. And then I rely on my wife and my agent and a few others to help me polish the edges a little bit so I don't sound like a big brute. Well, I have to ask you, because I don't know you, is, was this a breakout book for you? Did it change anything in your career? You know, I, um, I wrote a book called Red Mountain in 2016. Mm -hmm. and it's four characters fighting for life and love in Washington State wine country. And that really changed my whole world and set me on the path to do this for a living. And then I wrote three more follow-ups to that. That was just so easy to do because I had originally been in the wine business for a long time and a big wino. And so those really set me up to do this for a living. I guess it was just last year in February, Red Mountain, which was four years old at that point, was still making its circles through book clubs and just in a wild way. You know, it was like that book that really strikes you and it hit, broke the top 100. Four years after it was released, all of a sudden I was like, I really want to write for Lake Union. I've been looking at them and stuff. But yeah. I'd had an agent in the past and um, we were back with my thrillers and we almost closed a deal with Bantam Dell and it fell through and I just got discouraged and got into self-publishing and really was excelling at self-publishing and, you know, making a living doing it. But I kept looking at Lake Union authors thinking, I want to be a part of this. This is whatever they're doing is powerful. So I had a, uh, I've never really told this story before. I had a, a friend because I lived in Washington. I had a friend who had worked on the KDP team, which is the Kindle team. And he knew uh, Daniel Marshall, who's in charge of Lake Union. She's the head editor. I convinced him into giving me her email and I emailed her at three in the four in the morning one morning, just 
completely jazzed up about Red Mountain and I had this idea for an unfinished story just bubbling in my head and I, I just, you know, I was craving this. So I wrote her this email that was just pretty much like, I'm not writing any agents. I'm not writing any publishers. I'm only writing you. I want to write for you. I'm uh, top 100 in the world. And she basically wrote back and said, I know who you are and let's talk. Wow. And yeah. And, and um, then just, you know, within a few weeks, they said, okay, uh, let's do this. Let's do a two book contract. And if you want to be released in the summer of 2020, you need to write this in the next four months. And I said, well, thank goodness that I have uh, I have the story brewing in my head and part of the story it comes from a writer's perspective so there's not a lot of research that has to be done right you know so then I just went to work like like crazy and I would say what Lake Union has done for me is of course found me a lot of new readers I mean this book is is yep. doing better than I can imagine it hit 24 last week in the whole world of Kindle hopefully you know not going anywhere anytime soon so yeah I would like to think this is uh, this is definitely giving me the wings to continue doing this for a living and, you know, giving me a lot of confidence and really just, I, matter of fact, I, in about three hours, I'm getting edits back for my new book for my developmental editor. And uh, I just love working with a, such a professional team. It's like having this big net safety net around me of, hey, if you flounder, we're there to pick you up and it just works together. And gosh, I, I love having a team like this. Yeah. And I work with a lot of publishers, but the Lake Union people, if I say I want this book, it's like, boom. It's in my email. Like, <laughs> they are just so easy to work with. They so work for you guys because by helping yeah, they, working for you guys, like if I say, if I find, and I have access to almost any of them, but if I like see one that and I'll be like, oh, I don't have access. And they're like next day. And, but I want to tell people, hold up the book cover again, because I swear I can tell a Lake Union cover. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, totally. I, I'm serious. They have upped their game because when I first started reading them a couple of years ago till now, I, it is just, it's incredible. And I've heard that people have said that, yeah, they got a new design team and their covers are just amazing. And, you know, so I, I always pride myself when I see it. I'm, I don't even have to look. I'm like, oh, Lake Union. There's, and I'm like, yeah, you're right. It's Lake Union. So I, I love the cover of this book. It did draw me in. I am a cover person. Everybody is. They don't totally. Like they are. Totally. <laughs> Of course they are. So that's what I wanted to find out before I let you go. When is the next one? When do we get? Because now, Boo, like I'm, I'm hooked. And if, oh, I, had the time, if I had the time, I'd go back and read the the old ones. You know, if I had, because I'm one of those readers too. But at the moment, I'm a little booked. But I mean, I'm I'm all there for you from here on. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I would, I, I guess probably about August fourth. Um, next year you're like a book okay so that's what I want a lot of you know authors are doing a book a year right because that's feasible with marketing and yeah so I think the only one that I know with Lake Union who's doing two a year is Catherine Ryan Hyde who's pretty much like a superhuman I don't I love her I, love. I love her and she's I don't know how she does it just like a machine and they're always really good and um, I've talked to her so many times but yeah she is I mean she's always talking two books down like you when you talk to her she's already got the next one is already <laughs> that's the best already works so, you know who else though i love too is robert dugoni i love yeah, him. yeah I, I just book. read um the extraordinary life of sam hell last My week God, wasn't that awesome yeah he's super talented and I, I really want to read his thrillers too yeah his thrillers are amazing but all you got like i just love you guys so much in your community you help each other i'm part of the community on facebook and I was like, I, I, I would talked about this book before I read it because I kind of do a preview and I was like, oh, well, I've never read this guy, but you know, he's Lake Union. I'm going to try it out. And then like you watch my next video and I'm like, oh my God, this book is so oh, amazing. I'm so honored and humbled. Thank you. So yeah. Much. I mean, the story, like I said, it's not just that it's women's fiction or however Amazon wants to put it in the categories. It has twists. It has turns. I, I teared up at different parts. And then the end, I just, I was like, I got to read another book now. Like I was just so emotional at the end, just so everybody's ready. It's a very emotional ending, very satisfying. You will love it. And you know, it was, I had to pause. I was like, okay, I'll read another book tomorrow. I'll just give myself a day. It, to get over it, there. Uh, writing it wore me out. I've never cried so much writing, just <laughs> literally writing the ending and um, uh, tears falling down. But that's when I know I'm really 
connected and maybe doing something special. Well, and you know, what I have to say is that when you're reading the beginning parts, you're like, okay, so, you know, whatever, maybe I know what's happening. You people, you do not know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just in case you think you're halfway through and you know, what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. Just be prepared and be prepared. Oh, thank you so much. You know, to be so surprised and love it. So I am so happy that I now know you. Likewise. Yeah, I, I really am. Cause I can't wait to read your next one and I will read it early and I will get it out there. I, I can't would... wait to share. It's set in, um, it's an Italian woman starts in 1969 and she's 18 and she's an artist and she's trying to figure out her way in the world in small town, Maine. And she's trying to get out of small town, Maine and like become somebody. And then there might be a little, uh, there might be a guy that gets in the way of things. Kind of a star cross. A couple of twists. I'm sure. Yeah. And maybe a little <laughs> Vietnam and, and uh, wow. yeah, it's been a lot of fun researching and, and working that one. Yeah. And you know, what's funny now is that those books that are set in the late sixties, seventies are now historical fiction in a weird way. You know what? This, <laughs> everybody was saying to me, uh, I know we got to go here in a sec, but everybody kept saying, I don't think you should write a Vietnam story because there, um, you know, it wasn't a popular war and yada, yada, yada. And I get that. And this isn't a Vietnam story. It's a 60s, 70s story. It's, for me, World War II was my mother's kind of right. generation, even though yeah. she was born afterwards. So Vietnam to me is the first thing I was I was born after Vietnam, but it's like I knew soldiers from Vietnam. I don't know many soldiers from World War II, you know? I mean, my grandfather. Yeah. Well, it's like, no. yeah, I, I think it's, there's a lot of room to read. And that's um, Kristen Hanna's book. It took place in the 70s, The Great Alone. And yep. there's a lot of Taylor Jenkins Reads, a uh, new one takes place in the oh 70s. God. And I I love her writing. So I think there's a lot of room for the 60s and 70s. Absolutely. There might be some pain, but there's so many beautiful things too. Absolutely. I was talking to Ellen Hildebrand and she wrote a book called Summer of 69. And yes, she told me list. that it was historical fiction. I was like, and she's the same age as basically, yeah, she's a little bit younger, but we were, but I was like, how is that historical? And she's like, it is now, it can be. I'm like, wow, we are like, <laughs> you know you're getting old when, right? <laughs> but I can't wait to read it. Thank you so much for giving me your time and just Thank you know, you. having, giving me the satisfaction of being able to tell you how much I love this book and, and get it out there. And that's what I want to do. I want to tell everybody to read this. Oh, well, you've got me so pumped up. I really appreciate it a lot. Good. Well, you let us know when the next one's coming out and I look forward to it. Sounds good. I will. Okay. Thank you so much, Boo. Have a great day.